My goal in today's video is to make you think, to surprise you at least once. If I accomplish that, then I've done my job. Hi, my name is Jack and I'm the co-founder of SkilledSurvival.com and TheResilientLife.com. And I've been sharing my survival and preparedness tactics and strategies online since 2013. So if you're looking for the list of the most critical prepper supplies, then you should make sure and start and check out my other prepper supplies video. That's not what we're talking about today though. Today, I'm covering a bunch of supplies that most people are overlooking. Prepper supplies that you may have never considered stockpiling until today. These prepper supplies are in the nice to have category rather than the essential category, but don't discount them too much. They can absolutely help make life during a long-term crisis a bit more comfortable. Okay, before we jump in, if you like this kind of content, if you enjoy learning about these kind of things, then make sure and take a moment and subscribe to my channel. It only takes a second and I got lots of new videos coming down the line that I think you're gonna enjoy and I don't want you to miss anything, okay? Let's jump in. Number one, pet food slash extra water. If you have pets of any kind, you should prepare with their needs in mind. Dog and cats are the most popular pets, so you should consider them if you own them. And you should stockpile some extra kibble as well. You also want to factor in how much that affects your water supplies. Small cats and small dogs tend to drink less than larger breeds. And if you own any sort of livestock, make sure you stock up on some serious supplies or have some backup systems in place for them. Here you'll see, this is one of the containers I use for our dog, Remy. He, uh, he's a 65 pound chocolate lab. He's about a year and a half and he's an awesome dog. But in a crisis, I wanna make sure that his needs are met as well as my kids and my family's needs are met. So we have these nice containers we, we used to put his kibble in. This one's almost empty actually, which made it less heavy to carry. <laughs> um, we have several of these and we try to keep them stockpiled. So we rotate his food to keep it fresh. So we have them in a line and we'll use one and then use the other and then use the other and we'll keep filling the first ones up. So in a crisis, we'll have quite a bit of food for him. And we, we try to stockpile a little bit of extra water. Um, we consider him as part of our family. So we normally would say we'd have four family members and we try to stock one gallon per person per day. Well, we'll just go five. We'll go five people one gallon per person per day, then we know we got our dog covered as well. So we also have some fish, so some extra fish food might make sense or what have you. It depends on your pet, depends on your situation, but for, for your loved family pets, if they are concerned for you, make sure you consider them in your preparedness. Okay, number two is contact lenses or spare glasses. If you wear corrective lenses, then it's wise to have backups. It's not very wise to assume in a crisis that you'll have access to new contacts once the ones you're currently wearing run out. And if you wear glasses, it's not a bad idea to keep a spare in your pepper supplies as well, just in case. Why? Because in a prolonged crisis, poor eyesight could become a major disadvantage. I know I couldn't hit the broad side of a barn with a firearm without my contact lenses or glasses on. And driving becomes dangerous. Scouting is nearly impossible. Heck, from a distance, I can't even tell if someone's a friend or a foe until it's too late. There are all major disadvantages during an emergency. So today I'm wearing my contact lenses and here are my glasses. So I have both and I have some spares of each. And then don't forget if you wear contacts to have some of your contact supplies available, right? Cause you gotta make sure they're clean and they're fresh and they're well taken care of or else you're gonna be putting in contacts that burn your eyes and, and could cause problems. So either way, you, I think glasses, everybody who has corrective lenses should have a minimum, a pair of glasses that help. And then if you wear contacts, have some contact solution. Number three, coffee. Coffee may seem like a luxury item and you'd be right. Nobody needs coffee to survive, but coffee can help keep you stimulated and active. For example, what happens if you're working in a survival coalition and putting a military sleep schedule in place to patrol your bug out location? Well, coffee will help you stay awake and alert during those late nights of being a lookout. That's just one extreme example where coffee is a survival advantage. Plus, 
For many folks, including myself, I love having a morning cup of coffee. It's a morale booster, so having a bit of coffee during a prolonged emergency might be a luxury that's worth adding to your prepper stockpiles today. And so here we have a couple of the coffees I have. I have some more in my survival pantry. I just brought these up. And there's some survival specific ones uh, that that are sealed and packaged in a way to last a very long time. Um, there's lots of coffee options. I'll let you decide. Bottom line is, if coffee is something you drink regularly, it may be something you want to have some extra and then rotate it. Or um, if it has a long shelf life, just keep it and, and only use it when you can't get other sources of coffee. Number four is favorite candy bars or sweets. Again, this is another extreme luxury item. Sure, you can survive without your Snickers bars or your Baby Ruth candy bars, but why? You don't need to if you plan ahead just a little bit. If you store candy bars properly, they can last a very long time. Or you can just buy some extra and start doing a bit of a rotation, always maintaining a fresh supply of candy at the ready, just in case. Now, don't go overboard and realize in a worst case scenario, you'll probably want to ration these as much as possible. But having a small taste of a favorite treat can be a major morale booster when the world is a scary place. So any kind of candy bar works fine. They're gonna last quite a long time. You can rotate them. Just try not to eat your stocked supplies up because you know you're having a having a bad day. And then hard candies. These will last forever. Anything like that, put it away, put it in a corner, put it somewhere where you, in your pantry where you're not gonna maybe somewhere really up high that's really inconvenient to get to. Um, that way you kind of save them for only the worst case scenario. Not just like I said, not like a bad day. Hey, I need, I need that stuff. And I'm guilty of it too. Um, I snack and eat sweets when they're in the house. So you got to kind of be strategic on how you, uh, how you maintain those. So you don't go overboard and consuming a lot of candy just because you have a huge stockpile of it. We all know at Halloween, when you get the candy for the kids, man, I'm, we gotta buy it like the day before. Cause if you buy it a week or two weeks before it's gone and then I have to buy more. So be very careful with candy. Next number five is good books, puzzles, board games, and toys. In a prolonged crisis, I'm talking about several months and years, there's going to be some very boring days. There could be a lot of sitting around at your bug out location, your bunker, or your home. Folks overlook this because we think that in a crisis, we assume there's going to be a lot of fear and a lot of action and a lot of things happening. We can't imagine sitting around doing nothing, but if there was a nuclear explosion and you needed to hunker down for a month or two until the nuclear fallout cleared, well, that's a lot of hunkering down. You'll need a way to pass the time without going nuts. I'm talking about books, puzzles, and board games that you'd be okay enjoying several times if necessary. And if you have kids, toys with tons of replay value are the most resilient. So Legos or building sets where you can rebuild things over and over again in different ways are the best. Okay, I love books. I have lots of books up on my shelf behind me. I pulled these off the shelf because these are books that I would have no problem reading again and possibly again, okay? So I'll give you a quick rundown. Endurance, excellent book. It's about a survival story on the open seas. Can't go wrong, it's gripping. Read it three or four times easy. Stillness is a key, good reminder to, uh, to help me uh, calm myself and be still so that I can be prepared for the day. It's a really good book. I would read that again, no problem. Um, Skin in the Game and Anti-Fragile. These are two books I enjoy. They're probably not for everyone, but I just want to share them because they're a couple of my favorite books right now. This is the one I'm currently reading. And Educated, I recently read this. It was another great memoir, a great book. I just love mostly all kinds of books. Um, I read anything. I read business books. I read some self-help type books. I read political books or like this kind of books that's learning about the world and how it works. I read memoirs. I read fantasy epics. I love books. So make sure you get some books on your shelf that you would not mind reading, let's say three times, right? Some really good books. And one, when it comes to board games, this one here, Forbidden Island, there's one called Forbidden Desert. They're collaborative games that have a ton of replay value. I would play this thing over and over and over again, and it's fun, and it's different, and it's unique every single time. And it's challenging, and it has different levels of challenge. So it's just a great game. It's just an example of a board game that 
I wouldn't get bored of very quickly. Um, maybe over months and years, yeah. But I'd have several of these types of board games in my house and card games and whatnot so that I could continue to entertain myself without any kind of electronic device. I love puzzles. I know some people don't, but uh, a puzzle to me, if it's a good puzzle, I can do it several times and feel good about it. Um, so have a couple thousand piece puzzles, 500 piece puzzles, and I think you won't regret that in a crisis. Okay, number six, non-electrical musical instruments and some spare parts. Now, if you play a non-electrical instrument, then you likely have one at your disposal at your home. I'm talking about a guitar or a fiddle or a flute or a trumpet. And so you already have an instrument you can enjoy during the long, boring hours. Plus, if you are any good at your instrument, others may enjoy hearing you play it. This happened all across the world during the initial wave of COVID-19 pandemic lockdowns. But what if you don't currently play? Well, I suggest a long-term crisis could be a perfect time to learn. I mean, there's no reason you can't add a harmonica and some sheet music to your prepper supplies. It's a perfect worst case instrument to learn in a pinch. Plus, if you do get good at it, it's a very enjoyable instrument to listen to. And it's so easy to take anywhere if you have to bug out. It's small, it fits in your pocket. And if your instrument has parts that wear out, such as guitar strings, then you want a nice stash of those in your prepper supplies as well. Here's my harmonica. I'm no expert at harmonica. I mean, I can... So there's some harmonica and guitar. And here's one of my guitars, okay? And so you have a guitar. Of course, if you play guitar, you need lots and lots of strings because you break strings if you play a lot of guitar and they go dead and sound as sound good and bright, so you gotta replace them. So anyway, having some strings as a backup is a smart idea if you play guitar in a crisis so that you can replace those and keep playing awesome music. Number seven, gas mask filters. Having a gas mask is great, but only if you have an ample number of filters to go with it. A gas mask becomes a silly Halloween costume mask if you run out of filters. Now, I can't tell you how many filters you should stockpile. There are too many variables, like the nature of the crisis, how often you're forced to enter a dangerous zone, etc. But I'd rather have a few too many filters than not enough, because if the very air you breathe could cause an instant and premature death, such as a virus, nuclear fallout, chemical attacks, you want to have a healthy supply of filters. So my favorite two suppliers of gas masks is Mira Safety, okay, and they have lots of filters, lots of gas masks over my shoulder. You might see those back there. One of them is a gas mask from Mira Safety. The other is Parcel Distribution, and they're both fantastic companies. They both have a lot of inventory. Now, if you wait and they run out, they're pretty good at getting more supply back in. Um, it will take some time, take some months. You don't want to wait on gas masks. You want to have the filters. You want to have the masks before everyone else starts buying it in a panic. Okay, don't wait. But make sure you get a bunch of extra filters so that your gas masks don't turn into a child's toy. Recommendation number eight, sewing kit. If your clothes tear, you might not be able to afford or even get access to new ones. So you should learn how to sew and stockpile all the supplies necessary. Now, I'm talking about old school sewing by hand, not sewing by machine. You can't assume you'll have access to enough power to run a modern day sewing machine. Instead, focus on the simple things like adding patches to holes in jeans and tears in shirts, etc. It doesn't even need to look pretty in a crisis. You're not trying to win any embroidery awards. It just needs to be functional. All right, so here's my wife's sewing kit. It's uh, got everything needed to do some very basic sewing, and she does that all the time. So um, a lot of times she shows up my, my dog's toys after he rips a hole in them. Um, 
we don't often do kids clothes and stuff, but she could in a pinch. That's the point. Like you don't need to be an expert at sewing. You just need to do the very simple basics to keep your clothes from becoming wasted or ragtag as long as possible. Number nine, contraceptives. Now this one is highly dependent on your personal situation, but for some folks, having a backup supply of contraceptives is a wise move. During the early days of a crisis, a pregnancy might not be ideal for you. I'm not going to go into extreme detail here, uh, but for some folks, this could be a prepper supply you really wish you had after a crisis hits, but have thus far overlooked. Number 10, a daily vitamin. You must assume in a crisis that you'll not have unfettered access to a grocery store. Perhaps it's too dangerous to go there, or maybe it's completely wiped out of goods. Either way, you don't want to rely solely on survival foods to provide all your nutritional needs. That's why I highly recommend you stock up on some sort of well-balanced daily vitamin. That way, you can keep your body healthy even if you're forced to eat only rice and beans for days and days on end. Okay, if you're still watching this video, then you should take a quick moment to subscribe to my channel. I've got lots of new videos coming down the pipe and I don't want you to miss a thing. So until next time, prepare, adapt, and overcome.